bread, and we are looking at the uh, the uh, the lampstand, the golden lampstand, um, and um, and then you know the, the, from the light of the lampstand, the whole holy place is lit, and uh, the inner court, and we also see that there is one more um, item that is there, which is or one more um, it's very significant thing that is there uh, in the 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 you know uh, in a court the holy place and which is the altar again so we see another altar here right and this is the altar and it's made of gold it's an altar of incense okay so a fragrant substance and this incense is burnt okay so the instruction is this we see this in exodus 30 the Lord says, you shall make an altar to burn incense on. You shall make it of acacia wood. And then talks about the length, width, etc. Its horns shall be of one piece. And you shall overlay its top, its sides all around, and its horns with pure gold. You shall make for it a molding of gold all around. Like two gold rings you shall make for it under the molding on both its sides. You shall place them on its two sides, and they will be holders for the poles with which to bear it. You shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put it before the veil that is that is before the ark of the testimony. So, so again, that position, if you see, it is just before another partition, right? that is the veil or another curtain, which which gives access beyond that is the holy of holies or the most holy place right so this altar <clears throat> this golden altar uh, from which incense is supposed to be burnt now that is placed like it very strategically just before the uh, the most holy place so some more instructions right so it says that uh, you shall um, put it before the veil that is before the ark of the testimony, where the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with you. Aaron shall burn on it sweet incense every morning. When he tends the lamps, he shall burn incense on it. And when Aaron lights the lamps at twilight, he shall burn incense on it, a perpetual incense, before the Lord throughout your generations. Okay. And then he also talks about what you should not offer. Right? You shall not offer strange incense on it, or a burnt offering, or a grain offering, nor shall you pour a drink offering on it. Now this is an altar where only this incense is to be burnt, nothing else. Right? And then we, uh, when we look at um, Exodus 30, uh, you know, let's look at Exodus 30 and uh, verse 34. Right? Exodus 30. Verse 34, <clears throat> Exodus 30 talks again about the altar of incense. Um, okay, verse 34, okay. it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Take sweet spices, and it mentions some spices there, and, uh, and pure frankincense. With these sweet spices, there should be equal amount of each. You shall make of these an incense, a compound, according to the art of the perfumer, salted, pure, and holy. And you shall beat some of it very fine, and put some of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of meeting, where we will meet with you. It shall be most holy to you. But as for the incense which you shall make, you shall not make any for yourselves according to its composition. It shall be to you holy for the Lord. Whoever makes any like it to smell it, he shall be cut off from his people. So it's like a very protective, possessive, you know, uh, thing for the Lord. He's saying, okay, this is to be offered only to me, right? It cannot be, cannot be made anything like it, should not be made, or you cannot offer, you know, to anyone else, you cannot even smell it, it says. Okay, so, um, so here we see that this incense, right, being offered to the Lord, this fragrant offering to the Lord, what does it represent? Okay, is there any representation? Does it signify anything at all? Right. 
So this incense, it refers to when we look at um, uh, Revelation 8, okay, Revelation 8 also has a similar picture where there is incense coming before the, the throne of God. There's incense that is coming before the presence of God. And Revelation 8 says that this is this incense that is coming up um, is the is the intercession or the prayers of the saints. Okay. Let's look at Revelation 8. Revelation chapter 8, verse 3, right? It says, and um, then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints before the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from God's angel, from, from the uh, sorry, from the angel's hand. Okay, so this this incense which is going up refers to the prayers or signifies the prayers of the saints. Right. Um, Okay, I'm just saying, trying to see if there's any other reference. Uh, it's just there. Okay, yeah. If you look at uh, chapter 5 also, like if you back up to Revelation chapter 5 and verse, uh, verse 8, that also is a direct reference. It says that now when he had taken the scroll, referring to the Lamb, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Right. So we see it in Revelation 5, 8 and also chapter 8 uh, also right? talks about the prayers of the saints. So now these are, so it's a reference. It signifies the prayers of the saints which are going up before God. And, and uh, which prayers, when you say intercession or prayers and petitions and requests and everything, um, it's it's there at the altar of incense. So we see that in the inner court. So where there is the word, where there is the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and where also we see the incense, the prayers uh, going up before God. So we see that you know, in the life of a believer, this is also something that is to be there. right? And we see this just before entering into the holy of holies, right? Okay. Then, the the uh, in the tabernacle of Moses again, there was this veil which was separating, which was separating that section and the holy of holies. And uh, inside the holy of holies, there was what we call as the ark of the uh, ark of the covenant or ark of the testimony, uh, and the whole most holy place. Okay, so um, let me just share that. Uh, I have a picture of that. Let me share that as well. Okay. Um, just one second, sorry. Okay, I'm sure we've seen it uh, just for us to, yeah. Um, okay, this is the, this is a picture of the, the menorah, just a close up of that, you can take a look. Um, right, so we see that. Um, let me try and just make it bigger. So we see it's, um, you know, seven, and uh, and the design also. Uh, it talks about some blossoms. It talks about you know olive uh, blossoms, etc. So we see that. So this is what uh, the the priest is supposed to fill, right? Um, fill with olive oil and uh, and uh, yeah. Sorry, in person class is not able to see it. I'll just uh, yeah um, the picture. Okay, okay. Then we let me show the other picture. Yeah, you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. So my question is, is Pastor, like, uh, God made, uh, sorry, God gave these things, like, for incense. 
and same like that for the anointing oil also god give certain things right correct to so, anoint all the items in the tabernacle yes, yes. right so apart from like god said like another like we should not use for don't duplicate it yes yes you don't use it for any other thing yeah yes, yes. is for only for the israelites or, or the new believers like if anybody want to like know how is fragrance and all they can try to make or not ah, so this this instruction obviously was for the children of israel for the israelites and this whole this um, this kind of worship or approach to god was specifically for them and obviously this command was for them right so it was not for a non um like a non israelite or non jewish person it was for them specifically um for that time right so that is what we see but it signified something and it also pointed to like what we saw in the, the, the book of hebrews it says that oh this is a shadow and sh it's a copy and a shadow of the real thing and it also signified something that would that the lord would bring about uh, especially about the offering and everything uh, the, the burnt offering and the altar and everything so the lord would bring about and in the change of covenant the change of dispensation we see that it relates to us right so so it's not so so the in, uh, the, the incense refers to the the intercession of the saints the prayers of the saints uh, which we would you know the reality of which we would walk in and it's applicable for us as gentiles or non jewish people it's applicable for us right so so it's not so much the the physical component of it you know obviously at that time the lord said okay this is what it is you cannot make anything like it and if you make it that person you know obviously the consequences are very serious that they, they would die but for us today you know it's what is applicable is the the prayers of the saints so that's the thing so your question is can we make something like it today yeah obviously we can <laughs> yeah that's it. right okay so then we see the ark of the covenant which is there in the the most holy place right so again it talks about made of acacia wood it's overlaid with gold there are these hooks there are these poles and those poles are also overlaid with gold and um and then so that people can actually carry it on their shoulders uh with these poles right so this is how it is um and so this it is it will be placed in the holy of holies the most holy place and it's there is a veil which is dividing the inner court uh, sorry in the the holy place and the most holy place right so this ark of the covenant is in the whole most holy place and on top of the ark of the covenant is what is called as the mercy seat and it has a again has a um, as a design and it says that there will be cherubim or two heavenly creatures angelic beings uh, being uh, you know the design of it involves them also that them touching the wings and wing tips touching and uh, and it's on top of that and uh, and the lord says that you know uh, let's let me just read it it says that exodus 25 talks about it and you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark and in the ark you shall put the testimony that i will give you and there i will meet with you and i will speak with you from above the mercy seat from between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony about everything which i will give you in commandment to the children of uh, children of israel so so in this place the lord would meet with moses with the high priest right and it was only the high priest who could enter the holy of holies right so the other priests could enter the levitical priests could enter the, the the most i mean they could enter the 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 holy place where there was the bread where there was the holy uh, the 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 lamp and the uh, altar of incense they could they could enter there and they you know we see that they would go change the bread on a daily basis uh, basis and change the um, uh, light up the lamps and refuel the uh, the or the oil that so they would do all that um and burn uh, incense they would do all that but the most holy place or the holy of holies only the high priest would enter and uh, he he would experience communicate with god experience god and uh, and that was the time right and it was uh, um 
during this this it would during this time and you know, it was just once a year and uh, it was a very treasured again a very um, scary place right a uh, glory of god the presence of god and everything would be experienced right and there was nothing what you what you see is this there was nothing for this high priest to do in the most holy place right the Psalm 46 and verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Right? So it where God would speak, just had to listen and talk. Um, God would communicate something. But that the high priest literally had to be in a place of stillness, had to be still and know and experience um, God in that place. So that was it, right? To, to still to be still means to be quiet to be idle to be alone and uh, this knowing is not just intellectual knowing but it's by experience right when a person speaks you know about that person when 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 a person you know by observing that person you get to know about that person so it's it's more by experience uh, so the word know itself means truth experienced right so Psalm 46 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. So it's a place of closeness with God. It's a place of communion with God. Right? Communion meaning um, of intimacy, and uh, it's nothing superficial, but it's deep fellowship right, with God. So this is the place for the high priest, and uh, it was reserved for the high priest. But today, you know, we are all the royal priesthood okay which verse talks about that yeah is it first peter 1 9 or second peter 1 9 okay so let's look at that verse okay okay hmm? Okay, First Peter chapter two, verse nine. Right, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we see that that, that is a position, that's an identity, that we are royalty, but we are also priests. Right, so kings, royalty, kings and queens, maybe, and priests unto God. Right? So this place is for us. Right? This place is um, oh, the place of intimacy, the place of um, this secret place, this place of communion is for each one of us. Okay, so so we see that uh, you know it's a special place, but it's also for us in the in the new dispensation. Okay, First Peter two verse nine. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so anything that you want to add? Any questions? As we look at this. So we, we see that it's it's kind of elaborate. It's uh, you know it's uh, it's something that is deliberate, right? But that's how God wanted it. That's how God wanted them to experience uh, or approach Him at every step, right? Every step had a meaning and a significance. Had something that they could learn, understand about God and about themselves. Every step, every little thing that they did, right? So right from the gate till the Holy of Holies, right? Um, God instituted this that way, right? But the 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 beautiful thing that we see today is that um, you know when we look at um, uh, Hebrews chapter four, right? We look at Hebrews and um, chapter four and uh, verse fourteen. Right. Seeing then, Hebrews 4 verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Okay, so what is it? 
Now here, verse 16, in the New Dispensation, he's saying, okay, let us come boldly, where? To the throne of God, right? Where God is seated, his rule and reign happens. So let us come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and grace and find help um, and find grace, sorry, obtain grace and um, obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So this is an invitation for us, right? And we are called to come boldly to his presence. So whatever was there, uh, you know, whatever partitions were there, they have been taken away, right? And also we know that in the temple, uh, in Jerusalem, when the Lord Jesus died on the cross, what happened? When something significant happened, right? The veil that was there, right? The veil was torn, not from top to bottom, but from, you know, it was it was just split completely. I'm sorry, from top to bottom. And it was, they say it was a very thick veil, you know, it was like a thick curtain, several inches uh, uh, thick. But that was torn from top to bottom, signifying that now we can actually come boldly. There is nothing that is separating us uh, from God where we can actually have access to God. Again, based on what He has done for us, right? the fact that He has removed our sinfulness, He carried it upon Himself, and whatever expectation was there, whatever sacrifice was required, you know, all the requirements were met in Christ Jesus. Right? So it's a it's a beautiful image. Like even as we look at the deliberateness of the tabernacle, of uh, of approaching God in worship, we see that we see the the beauty of it in the cross, right? That the Lord Jesus paying the price so that you we you and I can have access, right? Okay, so let's move on um, to another uh, another picture, another. Another you know beautiful uh, aspect of worship that we see in the Old Testament, which is the tabernacle that uh, David built, right? The tabernacle of David, or what is called as a Davidic order of worship, right? So this tabernacle of David, or this order of worship of David, uh, which continued even when you know from the wilderness the tabernacles were replaced replaced by the temple um which was built by solomon solomon but this order of worship the way the manner in which god was worshiped in the tabernacle which david built that continued even in the temple okay that's what we're saying that the order and so it's it's good for us to study okay now what happened in the tabernacle right uh, what was the order of worship just like how we see in the tabernacle of moses we see this pattern we this see this pathway um and kind of like a map uh, and things to be done in order to approach god approach the presence of god in order to worship him right so in the tabernacle that david built so we see a similar thing so uh, let's look at that right um okay right so, uh, just to give a little background of uh, you know how and why and how did this whole thing happen, um, we see we we start in First Samuel chapter four and verse four it says that um, um, they wanted to bring the ark of the covenant, uh, which dwells between the cherub, uh, the ark of the covenant, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phineas, were there with the ark of the covenant. Okay, so this is what uh, we see that why because there was a war between the Philistines and the Israelites, and uh, they wanted to bring this Ark of the Covenant, and uh, so that they can they can win against the Philistine army. Okay, so we see that it was a time when there was open blatant sin by these priests, right? sons of Eli. The Lord was displeased. They were actually desecrating the place uh, and uh, doing highly immoral things right there in the tabernacle. So the Lord was very displeased with them. And uh, so they had actually taken this Ark of the Covenant into battle and uh, because it represented God, represented the presence of God, and they just wanted to win against the uh, Philistine army. But you know, the Ark of the Covenant was not like a good luck charm. 
right? It represented God, it represents the presence of God. And because of all this sin and uh, sinfulness by these priests themselves, right? The Lord was displeased and Israel was defeated, right, in that battle. So there was a uh, loss of lives and it talks about uh, thousands of people, almost 30,000, you know, soldiers of the Israelites who were, who, who, were, who were killed in that battle, right? So 1 Samuel 4 and verse 11 says that the ark of God was captured and these two priests, sons of Eli, they died. Now the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines and they kept it, they took it to their uh, place and they kept it inside their temple. Okay, So that deity, uh, their deity, the idol that they had had uh, called Dagon, they kept it inside that temple. Okay. But something strange happened. Right, The next day when they went into their temple, when they opened the temple and they went in, they saw that this idol, which was there, placed it next to the idol, placed the Ark of the Covenant next to the idol. They found that the idol had fallen and broken, right? So for the next seven months, so they were scared. They, for the next seven months, they moved it from place to place. They moved it from one city to another city. And, uh, you know, strange things would happen. There would be some skin conditions that would, uh, that would uh, you know, break out and boils that would come and, and all these things would did happen so they moved it then they said okay let's just give it back to the israelites you know this thing we cannot handle it you know the, a lot of things are happening so so what they did was they they uh, they just left it there they returned it to, to israel right so we see that in first samuel 6 and also second samuel 6 verse 6 right um the tabernacle uh uh, the, the Ark of the Covenant was uh, kept there. But then in the tabernacle, during this time, okay, the Ark of the Covenant was taken, but the tabernacle obviously was there, still there in Israel, right? And we see this term, you know, kabod refers to the glory of God, right? The weighty glory of God, kabod of God. Um, we see this term which is used, that ikabod, which means the glory of the Lord had departed. So people said ikabod. The Ark of the Covenant is not there. The glory of the Lord has departed. So it was a it was a worship that was happening. It continued, but it was without the Ark of the Covenant. So you can imagine, right? Without the glory of God, without the presence of God, they were continuing with their ritualistic offering, going in and showbread, and you know, replacing the oil and the lamp and and offering the altar of incense, but. In the holy, in the most holy place, something was missing, missing, which was the Ark of the Covenant. So, so we see that kind of a scenario in Israel. So this is what was happening, right? So after almost seven decades, right? So David brought back the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, right? And he put a big, um, uh, big, big tabernacle or a big tent, and kept the Ark in it, right? And he also established a kind of worship, which included singing and music, right? So let's read about that, right? First Chronicles and chapter 16. Okay, let's... Uh, First Chronicles 16 is where we see uh, a lot of information in First Chronicles about this tabernacle, right? So verse 1 says, So they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tabernac tabernacle that David had erected for it. Then they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. And when David had finished offering the burnt uh, offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. Then he distributed to everyone of Israel, both man and woman, a, a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins, and so on. So, so this is what he did, right? Um, and uh, then we see that he, when we go to uh, chapter 16 and verse 4, 4 and 6 following, he says, he appointed, right, the very next verse, he appointed some of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord, to commemorate, to thank, and to praise the Lord of Lord God of Israel. Okay, So he says, okay, this is what you need to do. He institutes certain people. And there's Levites, and then he says that this is what you need to do. You need to, you know, give thanksgiving and praise and uh, commemorate the Lord uh, of, uh, and, and you need to do this, right? So David writes a psalm there 
to dedicate the ark, okay, which we see on the first day, verse 7, on that day, David first delivered this psalm into the hands of Asaph and his brethren to thank the Lord. Okay, and um, and we see this this psalm was written and this psalm was used in thanking the Lord right before the Ark of the Covenant, and this is in the tabernacle. Okay, and uh, they say that this this psalm actually is a mix of uh, this song actually is from Psalm 105 and 96 and and so on, right? So so they minister before the Lord. If you go down to verse 37, right? Same chapter, 1 Chronicles one Chronicle 16, 1 Chronicles 16 and 37 says, So he left Asaph and his brothers there before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to minister before the Ark regularly as every day's work required. Okay, so, so it became a daily thing and uh, to minister regularly and, uh, and they were there. It, it says that, And Obed-Edom with his 68 brethren in, including Obed-Edom, the son of Jeruthun, and Hosea, they were the gatekeepers, right? And Zadok, the priest, and his brethren, the priest before the tabernacle of the Lord at the high place that was at Gibeon. So, so we we see that Asaph and all these people were there, and uh, we see that they began to regularly, and they began to, you know, praise, worship, thank the Lord. Etc. So they began doing this on a regular basis, right? Okay. Then we see that uh, if you move to actually, if you look at chapter, yeah, Second Chronicles eight and verse fourteen. Let's um, let's quickly just see there. Second Chronicles chapter eight, verse fourteen. So this is about the temple, but we see that that was that was a reflection of what was happening in the tabernacle, right? Um, Second Chronicles chapter eight and verse fourteen says, "And according to the order of David his father, okay, according to the Davidic order of worship in David's tabernacle, Solomon did this. He appointed the division of priests for their service and Levites for their duties to praise and serve before the sorry uh, as a duty to for for each day required. Okay, uh, the praise and uh, to serve before the priests." Um, and the gatekeepers by their divisions, for so David, the man of God, had commanded. So it's a God, according to what David described, according to what he, he he kind of the worship that he put together. So he followed that. Okay. So so what was the kind of um, you know kind of worship that was happening? We see that you know there was a uh, there was a very detailed uh, you know order of worship. There were about singers, some 288 singers, musicians, uh, thousands of them. And we see all that you know, in great detail. It is being mentioned uh, in Chronicles. And when we look at, um, I think we're going to look at prophetic worship a little later. And uh, we will look at uh, that, the kind of Davidic uh, worship that was followed there. Right? So, OK. So we see this, you know, uh, this kind of worship. And we see that it was also. Uh, at some point, it, it had become twenty four seven. Meaning, there were this, there was this roster, and there were these uh, priests, and they were offering of this worship in song, and before the uh, the Ark of the Covenant, and it was a daily thing, and it was also something that they would do twenty four hours a day. Right? Not the same people, but every two hours there would be change. Right, they would uh, people would come and change and um, and uh, change as in there, there would be another set coming and they would be leading and, and in the worship and so on. Right, and there were some specifications that we see, you know, with their. Um, if you look at one Chronicles twenty five, uh, there were these. Um, it lists out the number of people. Right, um, they would sing, they would prophesy. First Chronicles twenty five. Okay. David and the captains of the army separated for the service some of the sons of Asaph, of Haman, of Jeduthun, who should prophesy with harm, harps, stringed instruments and cymbals, and the number of the skilled men performing their service. Um, and then it goes on, of the sons of Asaph, or so many, and, and so on. Right. So we see that they, they played instruments. 
they were singing songs of thanksgiving they were lifting up the name of the lord but they were also singing or worshiping god in a prophetic manner right so so what does that mean that means that they were inspired by the holy spirit to sing out certain things these were prophetic utterances or prophetic songs uh, and they were they were singing that they were declaring that right and uh, so that was happening okay and further on in the in the same chapter we see that uh, verse 7 so the number of them with their brethren who were instructed in the songs of the lord all who were skillful was 288 so these were the musicians uh, and uh, or you could say you know people who were leading people who were singing um uh, this was 288 people right okay um what is interesting is that this order of worship so we see it's it's continuous we see it's prophetic we see that yeah there were these instruments being used um we see that there is that order what other things that we see we see that it was skillful right it was not random they were trained they were skilled musicians so we see all that in the davidic order of worship okay and if you look at acts 15 okay um in acts 15 uh, we see this order of worship being mentioned it's very interesting right we see that suddenly out of nowhere it is just mentioned there and it uh, and as a prophecy that the lord is actually restoring that kind of worship back into the body okay acts chapter 15 okay. let's look at um, this is in the the council the jerusalem council okay where uh, um, james is speaking why why do they meet they want to you know they they want to actually instruct the non jewish churches right there were these non jewish or Gentiles who were coming to the Lord, they were worshipping along with the Jews uh, as believers in Jesus Christ, and they were gathering together along with the Jews. And so they, they decided that there were some instructions to be given about you know, what kind of food to avoid, like food offered to idols, uh, with things with strangled uh, or blood in it, and then definitely sexual immorality, etc. We need to avoid and, and so on. So they 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 instructed that so they when they just before that just before putting together this instruction james after hearing the testimony of uh, you know uh, of how people were filled with the holy spirit and how they came to the lord this is what he says right that that god puts no distinction he purifies them by faith and uh, and how we believe just as how we believe th through the grace of the lord jesus how we can be saved, the same manner they are also being saved. Right? And so he says, that uh, James says in verse 15, and with this, the words of the prophets agree. Okay? Just as it is written, after this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. Right? It's a very interesting thing, right? So James is referring to the prophecy of, uh, of, uh, uh, of Prophet Amos. Right? And uh, he's saying, you know, this is what the Lord says, that there will be a return, the Lord's return, and there will be a rebuilding of that kind of Davidic order of worship. Okay. Rebuilding of the tabernacle of David. That this kind of worshipping the Lord in, in song and in prophetic words and utterances with instruments and with skilled instruments and, and so on. Right. So this, is, this will be rebuilt. Verse 17, so that the rest of mankind may also seek the Lord. And... Uh, and even the Gentiles who are called by my name. So that was a that was a thing. You know, it was a season where the, the Gentiles were coming to the Lord. Right? They realized that this was not for Jews alone, that this was for Gentiles. And then we see this. He quotes the 
uh, prophecy james quotes this prophecy and it says you know now we are living in those times and there that lord is rebuilding the tabernacle of uh, david okay so we see this um in uh, in the book of acts okay right um okay there is another section uh, uh, that we, you know we, we probably will close with this we see that uh, you know in this particular davidic order of worship we learn something about the kind of people who were called to minister before the lord the kind of people who um, you know uh, what 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 kind of qualifications what kind of skills that they had and um, and we we can learn something so we can say that okay this is this is what david laid down okay so we see this in 1 chronicles 25 right let's um, let's turn to 1 chronicles 25 okay um okay david and the captains of the army separated for the service some of the sons of asaph so it talks about separation first right separation so that they can prophesy with harps instruments symbols and uh, and they were skilled men, they were serving the Lord. So it talks about separation, segregation, okay, which means that they were actually consecrated, set apart for holy use. Right? So in other words, the first quality that we see in the kind of, if you want to say, the worship team right, that, that David put together, those who would minister before the Lord, the first thing is that consecration, which means there is no compromise. It's not isolation. Okay, we need to understand that, right? It's not that I'm just going off by myself. You know, I don't want to have anything to do with, you know, uh, with my neighbor or with, you know, it's not that. It is consecration. Okay. So what is the difference? The difference is that you are in that community, but the way you live is different. Your choices are different. Okay. Your, your, you are consecrated to the Lord. Your priorities are different. Like you don't do things the way the world would do it, right? So that is what it, they were set apart for this. They were consecrated for this, right? So um, do we see this? They were separated unto God. They were separated from the world. When we say world, you know, many times we think that, okay, I need to be alone or I need to be with people, you know, who are like me, you know, uh, in, in terms of, okay, I need to be with believers only. That's not what it, it, it means, you know. So that is isolation. This is consecration, which means you are there. You cannot, you know, you can't go out of the world, right? You are there, but the way you live your life is very different. It's separated. Your choices are different. Your lifestyle is different, right? Your, um, you know, our... Uh, uh, choice of entertainment is different. Our conversations are different, right? Uh, everything, our leisure, the way we spend our leisure, it's different, right? Um, in the sense, it's not the way of the world which would contradict with the word. Okay, so that's the thing. It's not because, okay, they are doing this and, and therefore I should not, because that's what the world is. That person is not born again and they're living like this. So I should avoid that. No. Something that contradicts with the word, something that is opposite of the truth of God's word, right? Compromises a standard of God's word. That is something that we will not, you know, we will not dabble in, right? So that is the thing. So set apart. The second thing that we see is a is a you know uh, is a ministry of uh, again it's it's prophetic, it's proclamation, it's thanksgiving. You know, First Chronicles six, we saw that okay, it was con it was uh, he instituted them to commemorate the Lord, to offer thanksgiving uh, before the Lord. Right, so it's an act of uh, it's an act of coming before the Lord with thanksgiving. It's coming act act of uh, being sensitive to the voice of God. Right, so we see all that. It's ministering to the Lord. Right, then we see that another aspect that we see is that oh, they were submitted. Right. They were submitted, they had leaders, and they were submitted. They were submitted to the Lord, they were submitted to one another, and uh, they did it um, out of a place of humility and submission. So, so there was ministry happening, they were, they were consecrated, they were, they were ministering unto the Lord, 
and uh, also we see that they were submitted okay then we see that these people were trained these people were skilled okay um verse 7 talks about that they were skillful right? they were instructed in the songs of the lord and they were skillful so which means that skill training equipping is something it, it's not unspiritual right sometimes we we look at it that way you know uh, if it is spiritual means i should just i should flow irrespective of what my you know skill levels are when i start talking talking about skill and you know uh, training and you know, it sounds very unspiritual you know it's something to do with ability and you know i'm offering my heart to the lord yes all that is true when we come before the lord when we you know it's it's a we know it's a posture of the heart you know so suppose you're saying you know it doesn't matter what chords i play as long as my heart is right you know it's it's not right you know it doesn't matter you know in what tune i sing as long as it's you know god knows it god knows the posture of my heart you know some people some of us actually you know, might use that kind of a thing but no you know as people who are ministering to the lord you know it talks about leadership right it talks about worship leadership or worship ministry so that's what we're talking about so when it comes to that there is a higher level of responsibility and accountability right a higher level of responsibility where we say okay i need to give myself to train myself i need to give myself to be skilled so that it does not become a hindrance to people it does not become a uh, uh, it does not become a uh, distraction even right distracting people from the lord so i need to i need to do this so we see instruction we see skill over and over again we will see it like right? they were trained and skilled you know that's another thing that we see okay right okay then uh then we also see that they were the verse 8 talks about those who were uh, you know it says and they cast lots for their duty the small as well as the great the teacher with the student okay so there were people who were teaching that who there were people who were wanting to learn and what is the setup what is the context it's in the context of worship ministering in worship in this manner that the david that psalm is the david uh, king david set up right so they were multi generational old young they were also varying levels of skill and experience they were teachers and they were students who were learning right so which means that there were people who were wanting to learn seeking to learn they were also who were people who were teaching right so we see this beautiful dynamic there and um, which means that this thing was passed down handed down to the generation there were those who had the ability saying you know let me teach you let me show you how it's done there were others who were saying okay i want to learn can you please teach me can you please show me you know all this was beautifully coexisting in that kind of a setting which david brought in right so we see that okay all this was happening there it was it was not just Uh, a random bunch that was gathering together right it was not just um, you know people saying okay i'll just do it it's just the posture of my heart uh, it doesn't matter what i play what i sing no there was there was some planning there was some intention to it right so that is something that we see in the david god of worship okay so we'll stop here and uh, if at all we have any questions we could probably pick it up in our next class when we we look at worship ministry again right okay thank you and god bless bye bye bye